You're listening to Always Building. All right. Welcome to the Always Building podcast. Uh, I'm here with David and Shenny from Lead Hawks. Uh, this is, uh, these guys are definitely paving some very interesting paths uh, in kind of, you know, the, the, the marketing and the sales space uh, with some really cool stuff that we'll get into in a second. But uh, I want to welcome you guys to the to the podcast and first kind of um, get a little bit of insight on kind of where you guys are coming from, what your background look like. And, uh, you know, if you can just kind of give us the whole story, how you guys met, how you linked up, why you linked up and all that good stuff. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us, Alex. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to come on. Um, so my name is David. Uh, I am a neuromarketer based out of London. Um, what is a neuromarketer? Basically, we as an agency are a growth agency that focuses on scaling B2B businesses by applying behavioral psychology and neuroscience principles. Um, so a little bit of background to me. Uh, I was in the consulting environment, so I was in consulting for about 18 months. Uh, loved it for the first six, hated it for the next 12. Um, big corporate environment is not really the best for me, it found out. Um, so I quit that and then with my best mate, who you will meet in a minute, uh, started Lead Hawks approximately a year ago now. So with that, I'll, I'll hand over to, to Shenny. Yeah, so my name's Shenny. I'm the second co-founder of Lead Hawks. Um, again, but another neuromarketer, certified and everything. Um, my, my background is, uh, consulting, but a different kind of consulting. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a qualified pharmacist in the hey. UK. So, um, did my training and everything qualified not too long ago. Um, went to the same, oh, me and David met at university, in fact. So we, we've been friends for, a, how many years has it been now? It's been, it's been seven, a long, long time. Like seven, eight, pushing seven, nine eight. years now. Yeah. It's too long. long. <laughs> Way too long. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, we met at uni, and we we both did um both did our years there, and um I came out, did my uh my pre registration year, and halfway through it, COVID happened, so my um my registration got pushed forward a little bit, and like David, I in, really enjoyed the six to ten months that I first started it, but I always knew that I wanted something um something that I, where i could apply some of my other skills and i'm not a massive fan of pharmacy in general anyways so this is a really good this is a really good venture that we started up basically amazing amazing man really really great uh, I, i'm curious so you guys met at, at at uni at university and mm -hmm. um and so david what what were you what were you studying in uni and kind of what what led you to that? I like to kind of get a little bit of context, like on the past, yeah, yeah. you guys have gone out on your own, you're doing your own thing. And um, a lot of people just don't do that. So I'm always curious about that kind of those steps leading up to that. So David, in your world, you know, how did that kind of look? Yeah, so I, I went to university and did a really broad ranging business degree. So I did a degree called International Management with American Business for the sole purpose of getting a year abroad. Uh, so I went to the States. Uh, I was at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia for a year. So I did my time in the States uh, and then came back, finished off my degree and then went straight from my degree out into uh, consulting. So I was in brand and marketing consulting, not actual consulting. Um, actual consulting is way more difficult. Brand and marketing consulting is, is not that difficult. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I realized kind of I, I didn't get the rigor of, of what I expected from consulting in the job that I went into. Um, so when I realized that and I realized that I couldn't kind of get the the future that I wanted out of it, I wanted to start my own thing. It was kind of like on the on the plans for probably midway through when I was at uni, I wanted to start my own thing. I'd kind of been entrepreneurial in the past and I wanted something to kind of like, I guess, give myself an outlet for that. Um, and when I got into consulting, I realized that I would have literally next to no time at all to focus on my own things. So when consulting didn't really pan out, uh, a mentor asked me, you know, what do you want to do in, in two or three years? And I was like, I want to set up my own thing. And he said, well, why don't you do it now? Like, you don't like your job. What's stopping you from doing it now? And it took kind of like a couple of tough conversations with myself where I was like, okay, if the only thing stopping you from doing what you want to do is essentially fear of it not working, then you owe it to yourself just to at least try and see what's on the other end of it. So here we are a, a year later now yeah. doing my own thing. That's a really, really cool story, actually. So leadership <laughs> at the job actually kind of told you, like, hey, man, like, you don't like it here. Like, what, what are you doing? What are you doing with your life? 
I, I wish it was the leadership at my job. It was not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they were they, they were pretty surprised that I was leaving. Um, but it was a mentor that I picked up. Funny enough, the, the person that actually kind of got me into neuromarketing as an entity was the person who gave that advice. So, yeah, uh, shout out Prince if you're listening, which you probably aren't. <laughs> <laughs> shout out. Prince. Shout, shout out. Uh, so, and then, Shenny, your, your kind of background. So you're saying you were a pharmacist. I'm, I'm curious sort of like how, how did that all lead? You know, what, how did you get into that? And then how did that transition to this? That's, it's really, that's a very strange path. I'm, I'm very curious. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, um, I guess it kind of started since before, uh, I guess before I kind of got into pharmacy because there was kind of like a little bridge between, you know, finishing um, sixth form college, like 17, 18 year old school and then going to university where I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And um, the two things that I really wanted to make sure that I did when I got to university was make sure that I met because I've always been business minded and I've always liked <clears throat> self-improvement and other sorts of you know that kind of like sphere of things so my whole point going into uni was one meet people who also like that and two uh, do something that will allow you to do other things and one great thing about pharmacy even though it's not so great as a thing in the UK anyways is that it's very easy to be self-employed whilst doing it so you can actually find the time to do other things and once I qualified, that's the, at the moment I qualified self-employment and that kind of made, I guess, the transition into, I guess, entrepreneurship way easier because yeah. there are obviously like two opinions where it's like you should have, you know, take the job and do the uh, do your sort of like entrepreneurial thing on the side and then there's just go straight into uh, doing your business and everything like that. Kind of did both. But knowing that I had this, it was really easy to do, I guess, the former. And that's kind of how things kind of moved along. So, yeah. And meeting meeting other like-minded people definitely made getting into business type things way easier. So that's awesome. And so where did you guys meet? Like, how, how did you guys meet? And, you know, what was the, how, how did you kind of figure out you were like-minded and that, you know, this, this, that you may have a, you know, a business uh, future together? I'm curious, like, just how, how did that kind of happen? <laughs> I want to take this one. I want to take this one. <laughs> I knew it. I was waiting for you to take this one. Go on. So me and David actually played American football at university together. Okay. So um, there's like a, they call it uni ball because obviously football is, uh, you know, soccer in the in the States. So yeah. we call it uni ball when it's American football. And um, <laughs> the first day I met him was uh, what we call draft night, which is basically all of the, all of the first years all get to say hello to each other and basically like present themselves to the rest of the team. You're making and... this sound way weirder than they need to. <laughs> listen, <laughs> listen, I'm gonna land it. Just relax. <laughs> and <laughs> me, meeting, me meeting him on that day, I was like, this, this guy's a bit of a moron, isn't he? He's a little bit of an idiot. And but getting to getting to know David on that day, it was kind of like the first step. And then I guess as time went on, um, we started doing things together. We started going to the gym together. We realized we shared a lot of the same thoughts. Um, sort of like the years went along and we got even closer. And um, then we just had loads of like business and self-improvement conversations. And it was kind of like, okay, there's a lot of, the, the way that you think is kind of the, the opposite to the way that I think, which means that you have, you more than likely have very complementary skills to the ones that I have. So if I'm going to pick anybody to go into business when I decide to go into business with someone, it's going to be you simply because there are certain aspects that I know that I'm weak at that you've probably got covered. And lo and behold, I was very right. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. That's really good insight. You know, I think um, a lot of people think that finding like-minded people is finding people that are the same as you, right? And I think that that's like, sometimes that can be a recipe for absolute disaster, you know? You end up like with two two left sides, so to speak, or whatever. So who presented first in this com in this uh, football thing? Like, who, who presented? It was, it was David that presented to you, Shetty, first? And you no, were like, oh, so, so we were all just presenting just to everybody. And when okay. I did, I think I did my bit first and he did his bit next, but- Okay, got it. He, David's a very boisterous character. And when he was around the other people, I was just looking at it, I was just looking at this guy like, what's, what's wrong with this guy? 
He's he's I don't know what's wrong with this guy, but that's just like the first impression kind of thing. That's and you speak to him, and then you understand what he's like, and then you understand the whole picture of David, and it's like okay, amazing, you know? amazing. Now that's great. So boisterous. So David, you're boisterous. I like I like that. Uh, <laughs> I heard that word in a while. Boisterous. Um, so David, like, so I, I, what I'm curious on your end, man. Um, you know, you're kind of. Uh, I, I honestly, I don't think I've seen. I don't know that I've consciously seen Shenny's Twitter, but I know David is kind of like doing the tweeting, and I, I feel like he's kind of the one, you know, doing this thing. And you got a really interesting format for your tweets, David. Like your um, your social media strategy is interesting to me. Uh, you're doing these kind of screenshots of uh, longer texts, mm -hmm. like longer kind of engaging texts, and um, you know, kind of, and it has a color. Palette, also, it's got a very defined color Distinct palette, and, color palette I, yeah. and, and I kind of and, and I enjoy it. I, I, I it stood out to me from the get go that you were doing something a bit different there, and I wanted to um, dive in. I don't always read them, you know what I mean. Sometimes I kind of like <laughs> through and I see them, and I'm like, fucking hell, I'm not gonna read that, you know what I mean? That's too too. But yeah. I'm curious, like your strategy on it. I do read some though, and they're extremely insightful. So I think. Um, I wanted to kind of get into your social media strategy a little bit too, because I think for the people listening, sure. like social media is like social media sucks these days. You know, in my opinion, it's fucking terrible. You can't do everything's changing really fast right now. It's almost moving too fast. You figure something that works and then it, it flies out the window and like engagement drops and like you do it too much, it falls apart. Or you do it too little, it's not enough. So I'm kind of curious how you approach that and um, why you decided to kind of go with the uh, uh, visual. <laughs> um, model that you went with for sure so uh come uh, this is probably about march i did something on twitter called ship 30 for 30 uh so dicky bush is a very well-known creator um him um nicholas cole i think and daniel bustamante run this thing called ship 30 for 30 it's basically a writing challenge where you ship 30 pieces of content in 30 days uh, and all of them should be, you know, around the 250, 300 word mark. So when I started doing that, they had this really cool little, um, I guess, little format that everyone would use, which is this 250 words on one screenshot that you can just write out in your own colors or your own format or whatever. Uh, and it's just a way of publishing 250 words in one block on Twitter that works and is quite aesthetic. So I started that and the first essay I went with, like, as you can tell, I mean, I, I don't know if this podcast is going to be video based, but if you look at the background behind me, Alex, you can see it like super dark tones. I'm wearing a black t-shirt. My background is very dark. Um, there isn't a lot of like color in the things that I ordinarily put out, you know, content or whatever else otherwise. Um, and when I saw everyone else's, uh, I guess, designs of, of their content, there was some color here, but it was lots of blue. Uh, blue is arguably my favorite color, but I kind of stick to neutrals, blacks, whites, whatever, when I make content. Um, and I saw some other creators and one of them did this really interesting, like orangey kind of color. Uh, and I was like, wow, that's awesome. And another guy came in and I guess he was asking for feedback on, on what color should I pick? Like, what do you think of this, that, the other? Um, and after I think like two days or like, I think maybe even after the first day, I realized, I guess, kind of uh, in the back of my mind, but semi-consciously that if my essays look the same as everyone else, I'm competing for attention against lots of things that look fundamentally similar. Mm -hmm. If my essays are so left of field some random person stumbles across it and goes, oh my God, what is that? I've not seen that before. Or there's any sort of like pattern interrupt. It, it will probably do better simply by virtue of like more impressions equals more viewership equals I'm more likely to get things seen. So based on this guy who, you know, had got this really cool orange color scheme, I was like, I'm going to make mine hot pink. And he was like, I'm looking forward to seeing hot pink essays. And I went, Fuck, I've got to put hot pink on everything now. <laughs> so now uh, my profile is hot pink, my header is hot pink, all of the essays that I wrote in that period are hot pink. Uh, and I just have this kind of like hot pink vibe all over my Twitter. And some people love it, some people hate it. Uh, I think the first time I showed it to Shetty, he said, what the fuck is that? Take this off your Twitter oh, immediately. Just, you look like an idiot. I despise uh, <laughs> It's, it's so painful to look at from when you when you're looking at it for the first time when your eyes adjust to it 
it's distinctively David, and it's kind of like, okay, this is yeah, distinct. I get it. That's what I yeah. felt. That's what I felt when I saw it. Like I, I really, I really had never seen anything. I didn't actually see the shift thirty and thirty kind of like format that you're talking about. So I'm, I'm like totally ignorant. I'm like a horrible social mm-hmm. media person. But, uh, but <laughs> seeing the pink really did. It did. It definitely did something to me when I saw it. I was like, whoa, that there's what is this? And I remember reading it and going like, hi, oh, this is shit. And then it got into like neural marketing and we'll obviously lead into that. But I, you know, that, that was where I kind of, you know, I don't know. There's some, man, there's some kind of like uh connection between those two, too. This kind of very bold, like almost like, like Shani said, almost disturbing <laughs> color. That just, you're just like, what the fuck is on my screen? And then, but, but, you know, then you're getting into like neural marketing. It's like, it really does kind of like funnel you into this thing. And then you start getting, curious about what the hell you're talking about what you're talking what you're doing there um so i'll let that seg right in actually to uh to talking a little bit about neural marketing um mm-hmm. well certified as as you said uh, about about neural mar- or, you know on on the subject of neural marketing i don't know much about neural marketing other than the <laughs> bigger blanket meaning of it but why don't you guys kind of define neural marketing if, you, if whoever wants to sort of start here you guys can kind of ping pong but i'm really curious uh to hear kind of your take on it and um what what it means to you i guess and why why you're kind of pursuing it and why you've pursued it sure um all right i'll tell you what we'll 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 strip it all the way back to basics alex i'm i'm going to turn this around what is marketing at its its simplest form what is marketing right message right audience right time sure uh how do you measure marketing it depends depends on the marketing goal i reckon but uh sure. g- generally revenue generally uh sales so okay and if you asked consumers whether they liked marketing or not what happens <laughs> uh that's it i haven't actually been bold enough to do that but i i'm pretty sure it would be like <laughs> no it sucks it's, I, I hate marketing i don't know what that is what the fuck are you talking about why are you why are you uh-huh. talking about i don't know you exactly when you ask consumers specific questions about whether they like marketing version A or marketing version B, what happens? Boy, it's good. You're going to get a lot of different results. I mean, that's the basis of like a uh, focus group, right? Like in, in some ways. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, it's a tried and true thing. But uh, yeah, getting the results of that is always like a, 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 a debatable thing. Am I right? Absolutely correct. And, and the reason for, you know, uh, focus groups being a problem is there is a there is something in, and I came across it in in my work in brand marketing is doing there is a massive difference between what consumers say and what consumers actually do and you know if, if you ask 100 consumers whether they like marketing version a they'll be like yeah we love it it's great it's amazing oh I, I love the font and I love the colors and I love the imagery and then if you actually see the results of that of marketing version a out of those 100 people maybe two of them have actually bought it or used it or whatever else, right? So the yeah. say-do gap is very real. What neuromarketing, at least in its in its purest form, tries to do is they take um, brain scans, so fMRI and <clears throat> EEG, uh, and they put the same kind of like focus group elements into, uh, or they rather, they use brain scans in those same instances, right? So you hook up the same 100 people, with the same marketing question, do you like marketing question A or marketing B, marketing option A or option B? And they look at their brain waves while they assess these two options. Now, I can say that, you know, I prefer option A for whatever reason, but if my brain lights up on option B, then I know as a marketer that option B is better. Whatever comes out of their mouth and whatever they say about option A is redundant because their brain actually likes B more. So that at its core, at its simplest basis is neuromarketing, right? So it's applying um, neuroimaging in some instances to uh, marketing to get more accurate or uh, better results for want of a better phrase. However, the problem with that is no one has EEG machines or fMRI machines just knocking around. Uh, and without hooking people up to electro you know, brain imaging, you can't replicate that. So what Shenny and I and, and the other neuromarketers that exist in the world, there are a few, uh, do is we apply the learnings from neuroscience principles, uh, from, from neuroscience studies and behavioral science principles to marketing. And then we just rigorously test, right? So like all marketing fundamentally in my mind is, is testing. Um, and when you test as if it were under scientific conditions and you say, okay, I, I want to test uh, 
option A versus a control group, and then the control group against option A and X, Y, Z, blah, 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 you now have something that has the rigor of science with uh, a scientific basis and not just, you know, people trying marketing, quote, unquote, let me just do this and see what happens. Like, it just doesn't work. So that was my diatribe. Shenny, you see what you want to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually want to take on the, I guess, the second half of Alex's question, which was kind of like, what does it mean to you? Um, I've always been a fan of Charlie Munger. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie Munger, um, obviously Charlie Munger, Warren, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, a lot of his, I, a lot of his things is about are about mental models, and he has a really nice piece which is on the psychology of human misjudgment. Now there are he highlights twenty five cognitive biases in that, which basically, uh, I guess, <clears throat> describe the ways in which we will do something because of i guess some sort of so, because of something else which we aren't either aren't in control of or uh, we just do by autom uh, automatically and neuromarketing is based on entirely that as well and that's really where so the overlap really comes in in that for me as well and when it comes to what neuromarketing actually uh, what it does and how powerful it is just seeing the the results like before and after when it comes to looking at what I guess the brain is doing because people people's mouths can lie. There's um the the I think it's is it the, the Cheeto study? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great one that kind of explains uh like neuroimaging versus so the the say do gap. So yeah, yeah. go for it. So <clears throat> the the Cheeto study basically is again it's sort of like the uh, the idea of the focus groups, right? They got Cheeto's got a bunch of people in to do focus groups on two of their adverts that they were currently running, and from these are okay, and these adverts themselves are themselves they're quite controversial. Controversial is that the right words? One of them was controversial One in the eyes of the. Uh... In the eyes of the focus group, at least. Yeah. So, people would people in the focus group. The resounding, uh, the resounding conclusion from the comments and the opinions of the focus group is that the we don't like these adverts. Don't run these adverts. They're too much. Like, don't do it. So, and that was the what they said. Right. However, what their brain did was essentially fire off on all of the pleasure centers in the brain. Meaning, even though you say you don't actually like this, your brain is telling us that you do. So they ended up running it. And wow! That, and they made millions. Yeah, they made millions. Um, the actual ad, which is which is quite funny, because as as you hear this, you'll imagine it, and I guarantee you, as people are listening, like their brains will go, <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, I get that now. Um, so the actual ad was. Uh, they had a little Cheeto person on the uh, on on the like uh, a devil and an angel Cheeto on either side of, of a person's shoulders, uh, and this person was in a laundromat, uh, and they've been waiting ages to you know put their clothes in the dryer, and this other person comes along and puts her whites uh, in the washing machine right as uh, or, sorry puts the whites in the dryer right as this you know angel and devil you know person has is about to put their, their clothes in and you see the devil kind of look at them, look at the whites and then look at the Cheetos. And this woman, <laughs> the person grabs a Cheeto, chucks it in the, uh, chucks it in the dryer with the, with the whites. And obviously everything goes orange. Right. And when you ask people, what did you think of the ad? Everyone goes, no, that's horrible. You can't do that. That's so bad because there's something called the Hawthorne effect, right? Like when you know you're being watched, whether it's by other people or by, by, um, uh, like the leaders of the study, you behave differently. You want to become whoever that person is or become okay in a social group versus like actually giving your opinions. So when you actually strip that back and just look at people's brains, it's a very different answer. Hilarious. Hilarious and uh, and really insightful. So that's, that's great. Great explanation. And um, yeah, thanks, Shani, too, for, for kind of diving into... Um, the Charlie Munger and the, the the cognitive biases and all these things, you know, all these kind of models. So it's really, you know, at this point, 
Um, you guys aren't walking around with EKG machines and stuff, as, as far as I can tell now. So that you, guys, <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you guys are, are and uh, medical equipment, but yeah. uh, but you're using basically these models that have been proven time and time and time and time and time again, um, sort of as the foundation for going forward and creating tests, creating different variables and different kinds of tests and different variations you're gonna you're gonna play with. Absolutely. So how does that trend? So I know what you guys are running um, or what it seems to be on, on lead Hawks, um, mm -hmm. uh, your company, uh, your agency is, um, is, is you're mostly focused on outbound sales for B2B companies, right? Which is, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough game. We all know it's a tough game. I know personally, it's an insanely tough game. It's very hard um, to elicit a response from somebody from a cold message, whether it's a DM, an email, LinkedIn, whatever, whatever it is, right? It's, it's like uh, people kind of have their blinders up and, and we're speaking in 20, in the beginning of 2022 right now. I mean, I think, you know, LinkedIn for, for at least a year now, maybe a year and a half, two years, right? LinkedIn's really been like saturated with spam to the point where it's just fucking insane. Like I can't even log into that shit anymore. I don't even, like, I, 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 I just forget I have it. I don't even have, like, I'm like, I, I think, I think I put my headline on LinkedIn as I make you money, you know, something like that, like all in all caps, like, you know, like what a, like a, like a, you know, uh, yeah, I'm trying to be politically correct, but anyway, some kind of real dumb thing I put in the headline. Uh, but you know, I just don't even look at it. But so with all that noise, with all that spam, with all this just insanity and with doing outbound sales from a neuromarketing perspective, using mental models and testing these things, what, what are you guys' sort of conclusions? What's your guys' strategy? I'd love to kind of understand a little bit of how you approach that. And um, I think maybe, you know, I think it'd be really valuable for everybody listening just to understand kind of like, okay, I, I get it. I get it. It's sort of focus group, like modern focus group. But, but how does that in intertangle into the actual like outbound mentality too, where you're kind of interrupting someone and trying to throw a message in their face? Yeah. yeah. So when it comes to, so this is where <clears throat> a few of the models that come out in your market and become really helpful, especially in just the initial outreach message. There's uh, one of the models of neuromarketing marketing is to steal attention is to get attention. You have to violate an expectation. Yeah. That is the that's kind of like the trademark definition of that kind of encompasses every idea of getting attention. You have to violate an expectation. And one of the easiest ways to violate an expectation is just to do the opposite of what everybody else is doing. When everyone else zigs, you zag. Very common kind of like trope. Yeah. And one of the easiest ways, and if we're just talking strictly outreach just you know just a one email or a one linkedin connection request mm -hmm. the easiest way to do that is whilst everybody is talking about themselves you talk about them whilst everybody's writing <clears throat> super long copy you write super short copy so everything is them focused everything is you know you could you could glance at the email in one go and not need to scroll up or down on your phone <clears throat> the whole message is there and that alone is probably i mean if we're talking 80 20s here that's definitely one of the most powerful things that you can do and that's a neuromarketing. marketing that's that's a principle that comes straight out of neuromarketing marketing as well so we learn yeah. a lot that's just one example right cool that's amazing think, yeah go ahead go ahead Dave. i think i think the, the the big thing to consider when you're kind of i guess assessing outbound and neuromarketing marketing and everything else is in a world where let's you know let, let's use the the number 100 for, for ease if there were 100 people doing outbound 99 of them will be trying to repeat the exact same thing that is worked once for one other person and they will all just spam the same crap so immediately the market becomes saturated with the same message and then a different one person will find some one thing that works then the whole thing repeats again, right? And it's just a never-ending cycle of everyone trying to copy the one person who's found the winning formula until that result is saturated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you so, see that so quickly when you Google how to cold email or something, yeah. right? You see these messages. 25 cold email templates that gave me X, Y, Z. Yeah, right, okay. And, and they're basically the same message, just rehashed in different ways. And I think what I'm, I'm really careful, especially when we talk to clients about it, is like there is no one answer. 
Mm. There is no one solution. There is no one psychological hack that is going to get you. No, it's rubbish. It's ridiculous. It doesn't work. And anyone, like you've been in the game for years and years and years, and you know that to be like fact, right? Like something that worked five years ago is not going to work today. Something that works today is probably not going to work in six months, let alone in five years. <laughs> so yeah. it, it infuriates me and it also makes me laugh when people are like, oh, okay, so like, tell me about the psychology of like how to get people to reply to my emails. I'm like, well, A, write good emails. That's <laughs> the number one psychological hack. Is don't <laughs> That's write not, the, an, not the answer they wanted. <laughs> <laughs> so like at a baseline level, Shenny's absolutely right. Like you have to find some way of, of winning that attention and violating an expectation is 100% the best way of doing that. But you can go a whole step further so imagine if if you went from you know everyone else is writing really long emails now okay that's changed to now you're going to write short emails okay again fine but then what happens if there is like an unpredictable reward at the back end of this right so we call it zigzag zer so the unpredictableness is or the unpredictability if we're going to use actual words that exist in English <laughs> language <laughs> <laughs> Must have pulled me up from vocabulary. Just we can, it man. <laughs> we're, just, we're just making up words as we go along here. Hey, we um, can do that, man. It's okay. <laughs> um, so if you if you add an unpredictable reward to these kinds of emails, and the classic one is like ebooks or like bits of shit or whatever, like random bits of crap people throw on the end, like, oh please sign up my email list and I'll give you this. Like, yeah that's that's the shitty version but like come up with something that is actually valuable to your prospect and just include it randomly in an email and that is the difference between everyone always asking for something and you turning this into kind of like a semi lead nurture campaign that becomes incredibly valuable for your prospect even if they don't want your actual service even if they do not care staying until the end of the chain is actually beneficial because maybe they're going to get something else really beneficial like that is the, the biggest difference. If we're talking about violating expectations, the short messages, then, you know, adding in un unexpected rewards randomly, like that's where you're going to get people going, okay, you've, you've got me something there. Fine. Okay. I'll, I'll entertain this now. Well, it's kind of funny too. I think the, the example that, um, Shenny brought up is something that may, um, it, it may kind of polarize back to the other side. Right. And you, and you guys are prepared that when, everyone starts doing the short emails you guys are ready to to, to engage back into the longer emails right or whatever right this this kind of um you know when everyone abandons the the long thing because everyone on the end it's sort of like these these trends that happen right and i think shenny's kind of touched on that a little bit and what you're touching on david is something that personally i don't think it will ever change i think that generally <laughs> speaking like it's not a trend it's just a general <laughs> cognitive bias maybe like shenny said maybe it is a cognitive bias that when i sit down to write an email and like i'm gonna write this cold email to this like CEO or CMO or somebody that's like been in this position for a while and they're like getting emails like this all the time and you're going to go and just naturally want to ask them for something. You're just going to naturally go, hey, you know, I'm wondering if we could jump on a 15 minute uh, coffee, call, coffee call, right? And it's like, <laughs> You know, and the guy and the guy's like, "What the fuck? I didn't like coffee with the what? The, what that? No, I, I, I'm too busy for this, man. I got like Google Analytics to to look at and big data to, uh, you know, whatever. Who the who cares what he's doing? But you know, this kind of thing and kind of what you're saying, David, is is something that I think is timeless because I think no matter what, people are always thinking about themselves and they're always trying to ask for something, and that mm -hmm. act of giving it, whether it's long or short form, you know, Shani, as he mentioned, is kind of adapting to whatever the the flow of what's happening in the in the space is. But um, that giving instead of taking, that's something universal. I think that's something people miss 99%. Yeah. And to even to, to add on to the whole idea of timing as well, because things move on a pendulum kind of basis, one thing I've also noticed is that once you can understand I guess the patterns and formulas over time of like how things are going to swing, you can just, I get, you can essentially capture the moment that it swings in your position, get all the momentum. And then that's how you make a lot of money really fast. That's kind of the, 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 the way around doing it from like a meta point of view. That's just like just an idea I've been pondering a lot, a lot as well. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, how, so how do you, how do you see it? The pendulum obviously swinging towards, longer copy people trying to copy these things off of google i've i've seen it you've seen it oh my god i mean some of the stuff like i, I don't even 
I don't even want to dignify it by explaining, but some, some of these emails I get sometimes are just like, you know, it's just mind blowing what, what they're doing. Um, and I don't, you know, I always like to think of sending cold email. Like w if I got this email, would I open it and read it? You know, would I even give a shit, right? Like just take me out of the picture and take what I'm selling out of the picture and just try to see it that way. But um, how do you see the pendul pendulum, uh, so to speak, the pendulum shifting right now? And sort of what, what are you guys kind of uh, observing from, from the results you're getting and stuff? Um, so, just, just really quickly, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm. You, you can answer this question, but I just want to use the, the the example that we often use with clients, right? So you you said that um, <clears throat> it's like I don't want to even assume that I'm selling something. I just want to kind of like embody that. Like, what would I say if I got this email? We take it a step further. Imagine someone turned up at your front door outside your house that you've never met and read your cold email to them. How fast would you shut the door in their face? <laughs> That is the ultimate test. Like that, that is our bullshit test, right? Because if it, if you got to less than like the second line, you, your email shit, put it in the yeah. bin, start again. Yeah. Because you need to be able to like run it through the mind of a door-to-door -door salesman. You need to capture attention immediately and you need to be relevant enough that you don't get essentially either told to fuck off or a door slammed in your face. Have you guys ever worked door-to-door -door sales? Never. I have and, and I, Okay. It okay. terrifies <laughs> me, but I love it. <laughs> I was just curious. I was just curious. I, I, I like you coming with that example. I'm like, shit, I wonder if these guys are like, you know, but um, I did do it for one second and it was very, 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 very strange, but you're absolutely right. And it's something that uh, it's something that is, is always, it's just ever present, that kind of vibe. Like, and I, you know, I used to go to a lot of trade shows as well. And it's a similar, mm -hmm. similar kind of dynamic, like walking around a trade show and you're supposed to sort of walk up to a person you kind of know who they are you you know you see them at the booth or you've seen them walking around they have a little name tag and you have to walk up and go hi sir i have some kind of pitch for you right and it's like you know <laughs> doing that it, it's almost like the cold email needs to read face to face like you're really face to face with that person whether it's door to door sales or whether it's you know a trade show or whatever <laughs> whatever have you there so and shinny you were going to throw something in on that i'm kind of curious what, what you were uh in terms of the pendulum sh swinging and um kind of what you guys are observing yeah, so I mean, when it comes to looking at a lot of the cold emails that essentially work and the cold emails that don't, there there are certain long form, like you said, we're not even going to give these listen a, a reply for these. Like these are just god awful. Like they're bold all over the place. They're four thousand <laughs> words long. Um, yeah. It's it's asking for a lot. We've we've seen some dreadful ones. We've even we've even seen blackmail in an email before. Oh, yeah. It gets oh, yeah. really bad. It gets really really bad. The blackmail ones are insane, dude. When it gets kind of like almost like, hey, you know, reply or I'm gonna, you're, you're like, yeah, what? yeah. So let, <laughs> you've got to even... love it, though. You've got to, <laughs> you've got to laugh at it. Otherwise, otherwise you'll cry. <clears throat> yeah. So let's not even think about those. But <clears throat> there are certain, I guess, formats of a cold email which are longer, which are kind of people are starting to realize. You know, they're not really taking. They're not really getting this kind of they're not really listening the, the right response anymore so people are moving into just asking like a single a single question in the email and if it's relevant enough because they've done their due diligence and i guess prospecting correctly building the building the list correctly <clears throat> reverse engineering people who are going to say yes so that you can say something else those types of people uh who you ask like, essentially that kind of question of uh, they are the people who are going to be like, uh, they'll, they'll give you an answer, they'll give you a reply, and that's when you lead in with it. So yeah. the pendulum is slowly swinging more towards that, but that will start to get played out as well because some people will, who have had that pitch before uh, will look at that and be like, I, I don't want whatever your services are, I'm good. Yeah. And then it will start to swing in another direction. And when it's kind of like a, uh, kind of like a cat and mouse kind of thing, where the moment you start to see those kinds of responses, it's now start. It's now time to start changing tack or to start thinking of other things. And if you're the first person to do that and actually land on something that works, then you're ahead of the curve. And then the pendulum yeah. starts to swing the other way when people start talking about it more and more. It's that whole idea of saturation again. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. And um, wow. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is really interesting. So what kind of clients do you guys work work with generally at, uh, at Leadbox? <clears throat> What's sort of the 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 general i know you guys kind of it seemed i mean on your website you weren't targeting like some real specific thing so i'm curious like what um what spaces you've kind of been seeing success in and where uh what kind of companies you guys help basically honestly 
it does depend like where because because neuromarketing gives us an advantage in that like and exactly what shenny said right like because once you're in the market and you can see how the pendulum moves mm -hmm. it you can tailor your messaging to be kind of agnostic based on who you help but in the world of internet marketing that is a big no-no right like the whole thing is niche down find your niche do your niche only serve your niche and then maybe expand out into other realms as as well um so if you wanted to take the super niche approach our our actual niche is startups um but i think and and we were actually having this discussion talking about the, the podcast that we're going to start as well like that there, there is marked benefits to niching down there are also very very distinct drawbacks from doing it for example using the podcast analogy um if we did our podcast on solely psychology there would probably be about six people in the world who would listen to it <laughs> yeah. no one is going to give a shit, right like no one yeah. cares because it's not that interesting yeah. to people who are not in that niche right but if you have a bit of psychology and then a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of this you at least are being interested by the content which means that more people probably will be interested by the content mm -hmm. so for the same reason we've kind of focused on startups because we think that startups have a lot of problems that are fundamentally quite simple to solve but when you creatively apply psychology to it they become instead of like hard to solve problems they just become massive wins very quickly um but i think for our for our client base the interesting element is not so much who we serve but how we serve them so we do something very different to i think basically every agency that i've ever come across uh which is that we our goal is not long-term retainers or long-term uh holding of clients we work with clients on average between three to five months and then we hand them all of the sops that we've written uh and then tell them off you go this is now your business you run it right so the biggest thing for us when when we looked at like how agencies function is that like a churn is a massive problem so how do you eliminate churn sign people up for an extended period and then release them into the ether then to kind of take the the more 360 kind of like flywheel version of this is at the end of that period they should be reliant on you for a service that is not your actual time or is not as heavily reliant on time <clears throat> so moving from done for you to done with you and then in the end diy where while you're creating all of the sops in the done for you part you then move to you know maybe twice a month consulting then at the end of that or during that period and then into diy they're using sasses that you have built and i think that is how you're going to get like the massive gains over time versus being entirely reliant as a, as a service provider because at that point the question becomes how many how many clients can you successfully fulfill yeah. without churning them because you have yeah. 75 clients and you know no one gets more than two and a half minutes of your time a month that's just fucking stupid right like, i would much rather work really intensely on one client show them exactly how they can succeed in their market and then go okay here are all of the things that we've learned here is the winning formula if you need us give us a call we're here twice a month we'll do office hours or whatever and then we're going to go and do some other cool thing because i've and i think this is what a lot of like entrepreneurs and people in our world forget is that like unless this genuinely inter interest you you're gonna fuck it up yeah like it sounds silly like you're just gonna get bored and then you're gonna fuck it up and then you're gonna be like oh why didn't this business work because you got bored that's honestly the reason and i'm way more adhd than shenny so shenny is probably big not problem. like <laughs> big problem honestly I, I think maybe this this is the thing because there's, there's the whole idea of like entrepreneurial add and entrepreneurial adhd which he definitely has i am the most one track person you will meet like i'm very much i will essentially bang my head against the wall at something until it breaks or until and until something actually moves and again that's kind of where the i guess the the this disparity and the compliment like the, where the compliment comes in as well because yeah. i could be steadfast in something that is clearly not working stop doing this now and they will see it before i will so that's kind of that's the benefit of that but the yeah the add is, is very jarring at some point no no so there, you touched on a really a couple of really really interesting concepts i kind of want to like go full circle with with what david was saying and also i mean choosing your partnerships is just so important man it's like one of those things like Man, when you make a mistake on it, I mean, it sounds like you guys have been lucky, man. You like you you found each other. You guys like kind of floated floated together, like you know, just just very smoothly. And it was like, oh wow, like the the, the door just <laughs> opened up. But for some of us, man, that's it's not that smooth, man. Like partnerships can be oof, it can be nasty, especially if you don't um, 
Well, I mean, also it's cool because you guys both kind of are in this psychology. You both have a passion for psychology. So it's kind of funny, you know, being in that mindset, meeting somebody and going, whoa, this guy kind of has the opposite profile of me. I think I'm in it, right? <laughs> like a lot of us are just kind of floating through life, like, boo, boo. And you're just like, oh shit, I found this person. And um, it ends up not really working out. But I think, um, you know, I think psychology is one of those things that like everybody should should learn, you know what I mean? Especially when it comes to like choosing partnerships, choosing business models. And like Shenny can be so transparent about what he's all about. Like, dude, I bang my head on something until it fucking works or it doesn't. Like, I'm I'm serious about this. And David can be realistic that, hey, man, I'm jumping all over the place and like I'm passionate about all kinds of shit and it all like, I, you know, and that's kind of like more my profile too. I got like ideas popping out of mm -hmm. everywhere all the time. And I'm just like, you know, kind of like trying to like tame, tame myself down all the time. Uh, but you had touched on something kind of in the service provider agency model aspect. And I think it kind of applies to almost everything, you know, it applies to, you know, I don't know, I, yeah, I'm making cars, making I, any, anything, you know, making manufacturing, anything, doing anything, right. This model that you brought that somebody comes in, you basically handhold them, give them a very personal kind of like figure out the formula for them, hand over the formula and go, when you guys need us again or when that starts to have like these depreciating sort of uh you know deprecating like returns from the thing or when uh you guys need some support or when you just need some some uh you know whatever and then also the SaaS side where you're like yep also they're you know you're just loading them up using your SaaS products or using um something that you're partnered with or whatever mm -hmm. you're know, building this kind of partnership network that then you can kind of like throw like basically you know, do the Rubik's cube and then kind of like throw mm -hmm. it over there and then do the Rubik's cube and then kind of throw it over there, right? It's this really uh, um, beneficial kind of um, cycle that, that you're building. I think a lot of people feel like they need to get into this kind of freelancer thing or this kind of agency thing where they're just like, oh, my clients are churning and I can't control the churn. And I don't, and especially with cold outreach, like we mentioned earlier, this is a tough game. Like, I mean, there's some companies this just won't work for it just won't like you, yeah. you, you think it would and it and it won't you know and you try it and you try it and you try it um so maybe that's something to kind of dig into here because you've kind of laid out the model for people i think anyone listening li listen to david what he said right there that's some crazy wisdom to pick up that, <laughs> you know don't put all your eggs in one basket so to speak in terms of just being a service provider because man i don't know people shit on service providers all the time people people you know, I just heard about somebody who was like uh, a person in the group who was like price shopping and, you know, he he had kind of hit him right at the right time. Like, hey, yep. I am looking to switch providers, but are you a thousand dollars cheaper? And it's like, well, no, <laughs> then I don't want it. Like, well, this asshole's price shopping. He's getting great results with an agency and he's already price shopping. How can I do this cheaper? And, you know, these people are just, you know, they're 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 uh, they can be scum sometimes when it comes to that stuff. So um, as far as failures, guys, as far as like stuff that hasn't worked when do you call it quits and especially shenny since you're the guy banging the head against the wall you know, when, when do you have the concussion and you're like i can't remember your name for a minute there and you're like you know what fuck this i'm this ain't working you know what i mean when does that happen and when how do you guys kind of measure that in terms of the psychology and the testing and sort of the variations of the of the offer and everything you're trying to do so luckily for me um i guess luckily for the both of us we're both really candid people who have i guess good intuition so I'll bang my head against something, uh, but if I know in the long run it's not going to work and David says, you know what, this isn't going to work, I just let go. Yeah, I'm just like, nope, uh, fair enough then, let's just move on. Um, so when it comes to situations with, you know, previous clients where, like, the, I guess the industry or one, one really good example is just companies that have, that aren't digitally based, so you so it's very it's not very easy finding just lists of contacts to actually reach out to that is usually those are some of the the more common you know this isn't going to work type profiles when it comes to businesses that you're going to do b2b lead gen online for via email or linkedin and so on and i'll be prospecting trying to find as many contacts as i can just go and every single any kind of software any kind of SaaS that i can find i'll just buy this and i'll get a list buy this get a list try and get a list here do make a list here and so on and so forth and the number of people that you get from that list <laughs> versus you know the i guess the return that you're going to get reaching out and getting a result for these people is just absolutely not worth it absolutely not worth it so it's really easy to understand intuitively that this isn't going to work 
even when you're really deep in it, if, you know, we have a partnership where you can kind of be candid and talk about these kinds of things. So that's kind of how I get around the whole sort of your head against the wall kind of situation. Nice. I think Shenny Shenny dropped a, a, a golden nugget of wisdom there in the middle of that, which was like, if you feel like when you're prospecting for whether it's yourself or your own client or, or a client of yours and the, the returns that you're going to get are not actually worth the effort you're putting in or the amount of prospects that you're you're having to prospect for, there is a problem there. And we actually found this, and I'll be very vague because it's about a current client. We found this with a current client very, very recently where we're doing so much work to find them one of their ICPs that like, we've we've reached out to other people in the industry we've spoken to like our internal prospecting team and we're like banging our heads to get a reasonable amount of clients uh, a reasonable amount of prospects out of it yeah and you have to look at it and you have to ask yourself okay even if we get like 50 percent of these people ready to book a call okay fine then you convert let's say 50 percent of those do I really want to spend another like 14 hours prospecting for that final amount? Is that worth it? Are the returns actually outsized enough that that warrants me spending the initial amount of time? And if the answer to that is no, then you already have the answer. And I think that's where Shenny's like point really lands yeah. is where you say, you know what, that amount of time that I put in initially just to find the prospects, what hasn't like actually, you know, isn't going to get me anywhere into the future. That's where you know you need to stop immediately. Got it. Um, yeah. So it is. It is a bit intuitive just seeing the, it because it is a numbers game. You're kind of breaking it down to yeah. being a numbers game at some point, which I think you are absolutely correct. I think a lot of, it's it's something that people want to avoid, but it really is. I mean, you know, you're of course it's a numbers game. Yeah. You're reaching out to people. You know, you're reaching out to people, and and no matter how, I mean, also like being the right time as well. You know, like yeah, yeah. that fifty percent you mentioned that maybe like. I don't, that's like condensing time into like this little block, but time's also a factor, right? And, you know, people 100%. buying things in December sometimes have a lot more pressure on them than when they're buying in February. And there's all kinds of, it, it, all kinds of interplay there, I guess, you know, within that ICP of like, and it sounds like you guys really go deep into trying to understand the ICPs and you're talking to other industry people and you're trying to get these kind of, these insights because there's, you know, the way that one industry works, like, I don't know, financial industry versus the way that, um, you know, the marketing industry works or something, you know what I mean? If you're talking about a, a similar SaaS product for those two different mm -hmm. separate industries, it's going to be a completely different rhythm to how those people buy and a uh, different kind of committee of how they buy and different kind, different amounts of lawyers that need to review <laughs> the contracts and different amount, right? Like there's just all these little intricacies that you have to kind of think about. And that's, um, I guess, yeah. So one thing I wanted to ask you guys, I know you're, you're deep into this and, you know, Leadhawks is... Uh, you know, it's definitely like a really intriguing, you know, the things that you're combining, because I've seen other people combine it into the paid ads realm. You know, there's some people kind of talking about sort of buyer psychology and intent data and these mm -hmm. kinds of things and loading all the, you know, using AI, which obviously, I mean, I, I, we won't, I don't want to speak too much on AI and like <laughs> how incredible fucking AI is, which I don't, I don't think it's that great. I think that, you know, having two humans such as yourself is going to beat any AI anytime, but, um, I've seen in other areas of marketing, you know, people kind of using these buzzwords and talking about mm -hmm. neuromarketing, talking about psychology, blah, blah, blah. But in the cold outreach space, you don't get a whole lot of that kind of um, terminology or people kind of bringing these sort of solutions to the thing. So I'm kind of curious why and how you guys chose Outbound as the channel, mm -hmm. as as what you guys were going to focus on. And um, are, are you guys happy in that space? And are you guys, you know, kind of like, expanding or are you guys pretty much sticking just to the outbound stuff or kind of how uh you see sort of uh lead hawks expanding and kind of changing and in, into the future um well when it comes to i guess if i tackle sort of like the end of the question um before the start as mm -hmm. far as like are we happy here and outbound and sticking in this area i'm i'm very happy here but you know me i bang my head against the wall so that's i'm always going to be happy <laughs> in that regard and as far as scaling this up as far as we could go, I want to milk this dry before thinking of anything else. And mm -hmm. it's, it's always, it's really interesting because if you, even if you think, I guess the sort of the principles that we put into practice now, 
because of the nature of the type of business that it is, they're going to pay dividends for the rest of our lives. Like being able to reach out and actually sell a service or a product of some sorts and just understanding the principles of that, you could go into, you could use the ideas and principles from that and you can go into any other business space and grow a business with it. Yeah. So even if we ever left outbound at any point, we would still be using basically everything that we've learned. And the fact that neuromarketing blends in aspects of neuromarketing, because don't get me wrong, neuromarketing is very wide, is very broad, and there's a yeah. lot that yeah. co- there's a lot that covers it. And it's really dense in some places and kind of sparse in others. So and where we use it is somewhere in the middle. Uh, being able to use neuromarketing whilst we do our outbound is really what's um, the most interesting aspect of just being a neuromarketer in general and um yeah that's i guess that's kind of how that works for me for the latter half of that question yeah um, but i I'll, I'll i'll take the the first part like how do we get into it and stuff i think it it actually relates to what shenny said right so like when you think about how you grow and how you scale businesses the first issue you need to tackle i mean okay Fine. The first issue you need to tackle is what is your offer and who does it help? That's the first thing. The second thing is how do you actually sell it? And if you're able to, as a business, say, okay, I know that I can write 100 emails or speak to 100 people on LinkedIn and that will get me business. I now don't need to worry about that. Great. Now let's find five people who can do the same thing and now you can send 500. Okay, now you found five people are they all sending emails or are they closing people over the phone or whatever, whatever, whatever. And for us, it boils down to, okay, how do we optimize this process for you and then put it in the hands of people who can do this for you? So this becomes a very attributable part of your business. So to answer the question, like, why did we pick it? Because in our mind, like outbound is how you grow and scale businesses. Like if you look at, you know, the, I, I loved the book, um, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Uh, if you've never read that, exceptional. Um, it talks about how like they were scaling and the head of sales in that environment and how aggressive he was. That is how you're going to scale basically anything. And the reality of the situation in my mind is most people don't give enough credence to outbound because paid ads has so much of like a talking point in the last you know three to five years. Mm-hmm. Now everyone's gut instinct is, let me throw, you know, half a million pound of paid ads and I might get some output out of it. And then I will either raise money or I'll use all of the revenues into it to throw more money into paid ads. And then that's now a thing. So, okay, what if I can get you five times the amount of prospects or clients with a tenth of the price? Okay, great. Now I'm just going to take that money. (laughs) Like it's just way more cost effective. And yeah. it has a similar level of effect. You just need to understand it. And I think most people don't. Um, then the final point to kind of like weigh into like, where is Leadhawks going? I think, are we going to stay in outbound? Yes. I think there is so much that we can add to the, um, the outbound process, both from a psychology point, but also from an industry point of view. Um, but where are we going as a business? Um, what we want to be is we kind of want to be the psychology people. So we take care of outbound and we show you how to do that. We show you how to be more effective on sales calls. And then we also make your team more efficient. And this is something that we haven't spoken about on on the pod. And we've done a fair amount of stuff on Twitter about it. So if if you're on Twitter, go read those threads because there's some some genuine value in there. Um, But we looked at when Shenny and I sat down and, and talked about it, and this is a fairly new venture for us. We were sitting and thinking, okay, let's say that we we go in and we completely sort out someone's outbound of efforts. We sort out their sales process. Great. Now they they are selling and and um, closing as much as humanly possible. What is the next stopgap? What's the next bottleneck? And Shenny was like, it's fulfillment. And I was like, yeah, but we don't know their industries. There's nowhere we can fulfill or teach them to fulfill better. Like that is so far out of scope. Right. And we were sitting around and we were thinking about it and we were like trying to ideate a solution to this. And Shenny is out of the two of us, the productivity guru, right? It, it's his whole like bang his head against a wall thing. <laughs> this is, he is, and this is, you know, very different to me. I am very ADD. Like I'm going to go, ah, oh, I'm going to work on this for 
14 hours because I'm really interested in it. And then I look at the same thing tomorrow. I'm like, I don't want to touch that at all. I want to do this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Whereas Shelly will do the same four things every day for nine months and then end up really bloody good at it. And I'm like, wow, how'd you do that? That's so impressive. And it's because it's consistency, <laughs> it's motivation, and all the rest of it. So he said, why don't we improve productivity? And I remember saying, okay, what happens if you improve productivity? You're able to do more in a short period of time. Okay, great. That's helpful. How many businesses or how many industries or you know whatever does that apply to? And we went through like an imaginary list in our head and we were like, well, okay, that's basically fucking all of them. Yeah. If I improve your productivity and you're able to get more done in less time, that gives you the freedom to do one of two things. Either do more, that's bad, don't do that. Or take more breaks, that's good, do do that. <laughs> Most people don't take enough breaks. So we're handing back like people's time to them. And I think that's probably the most powerful thing you can give someone is giving them back their time. So we said, okay, how do we improve people's time? So what we did is we partnered with this cool little startup out of, where are they based? Like Austria or somewhere in, believe, somewhere in Europe somewhere? I believe it's Yeah. Um, they're a cool little startup called Timula. If you've never heard of them, I would recommend having a look at them. They're awesome. They give you this eight-sided little tetrahedron. Um, and basically what this does is if you place this tetrahedron down on one side, it a Bluetooth tracker in it will start tracking a specific activity. What we did was we took that thing from the tech behind it and we created a whole productivity methodology. So what that does is it helps you um, achieve your longer term goals. It helps you uh, categorize unplanned work that just comes up because that is the number one cause of like low productivity and low motivation is random bits of shit getting your boss who's just put something on your desk going, ah, do this right now. It needs to be done. Yep. In reality, it probably didn't need to be done right now. It could have been done in the next week. Or it didn't need to be on your desk. It didn't need to be on someone else's desk. You know, he's giving it to you, right? <laughs> so by, by getting people into the mindset of, okay, let's take a really logical approach to how to solve this problem, we found that we can drastically improve people's productivity just through using really basic psychology. So there's two people that I think are like, you know, the obvious one is James Clear, Atomic Habits. You know, yep. I think half the world and their grandmother has read Atomic Habits. That's fine. And Shenny and I were discussing this, and I'm, I'm going to get a lot of hate for this, but I don't care. Um, James Clear's Atomic Habits is fantastic if you are a moron. Yeah. It's super yeah. entry level. Yeah. If, if you have absolutely no idea on, like, the world outside and you've never thought about being productive in your life james clear atomic habits will blow your fucking mind because it's so simplistic that it gives you like do this then do this then do this then do this and then do this and you're like huh okay if i do all of those things i will 100 be more productive i completely agree for that purpose it is excellent yeah. however if you actually want to be more productive read near ial's uh indistractable that is genuinely how you will become more productive if you already intuitively know james clear's stuff and you're like yeah but this isn't actually helpful which is what i was like so near al n-i-r-e-y-a-l indistractable um that will blow your mind so we took a lot of the learnings from james clear we took a lot of the learnings from near al and we uh built in um to this productivity methodology tech uh a fancy dashboard that's being <laughs> built as we speak uh and basically enable people to take control back of their time and it comes with two benefits one the organization will become more productive and two it gives people the freedom to you know if your boss is constantly throwing shit on your plate and being like this needs to be done or you need to do this or you need to do whatever 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 you can go back to them and say hey look i'm spending this much time on stuff that in my mind should be automated i need extra resource or i know that you're doing this and this is our key goal for the for, for the quarter well, I haven't spent any time working on that because I've been working on this other dumb shit that keeps getting put on my plate. How can I fix that? And by doing that, you, you completely change people's perspective on productivity. So when you have the trifecta of outbound, helping them close more sales and then making their organization more, more productive, that's how you actually grow a business. I Not love fucking it. spending money on, on Facebook ads. <laughs> Facebook ads, yeah. Facebook ads, Facebook ads, Facebook ads, Facebook ads, Facebook ads, right? Yeah, no, wow, that's that's uh, that was a mouthful, man. That's amazing. So I, I guess I, I kind of want to touch on a couple of things. I mean, I think uh, for everyone listening, uh, this is this is this is going totally off the rails here, where this is like getting uh, really really deep here. I think number one, 
something that Shani threw out there was that these skills, you know, that you've led that have led you to what you guys have been doing can be translatable into any goddamn thing you want to do in the future. It doesn't matter. Like every, you know, every step you guys have taken going into outbound, committing to outbound, whatever that may be and stuff before that, even probably playing American football, all these things all kind of coalesce together, you know what I mean? Into one like central thing where it's like, dude, like skills never expire like you don't lose like skills and focus and things that you get into they they apply to almost everything and everything you guys are doing in outbound also applies to paid ads and also applies, applies to any other kind of marketing strategy that you can imagine right so it's like everything you guys are learning is is usable in some other form and i think everybody should like internalize that and, and whoever's listening should should think about that and think about um shani's wisdom that you dropped right there that like you know don't you can't really waste time early on when you're first getting into stuff and you're first learning and you're first getting into it. You know what I mean? It's like that time you're picking up things by the second that, that are more important than, um, you know, any tactic you're going to learn in a course or something like that. It's like an actual process that you've engaged in. Um, this like productivity enhancing hardware hybrid <laughs> uh, uh, extension to sales and marketing teams to help them be more prod productive and more focused and more accountable for their time and, and being able to actually do what most of us can't do, which is speak intelligently about like our time and our focus and where our focus has been and what we've been doing further than like a time tracking tool where you literally have to go into the thing and like, Mm -hmm. go on the track like, uh, uh fuck you know and i i always hated those things i had a couple jobs where i had to do time tracking and it was just like even when it's like a chrome extension or it's a fucking thing in the mac it's like so irritating this thing is just some thing you go and you go eh, clang, and like you just slap it on your desk and now you are engaged in something um huge huge thing and also the logic jump that you guys made from okay what's after outbound um what's after lead gen um sales okay what's after sales fulfillment well yeah but productivity in this <laughs> environment and making the impact of like our service more heavy on their organization right because it's like yeah. <clears throat> i know when i was doing this stuff it, it you know like doing outbound stuff for clients it was like a very difficult thing to get people to it was it was difficult like that was the other side it's like i could do I, we could do a great job and get them all the leads of the world and we know they're qualified and we're checking double checking whatever and then you're handing them to them and it's kind of going into a black hole you know and like oh, okay let's try to set them up with a crm and <laughs> they don't use it and then like oh let's set them up with this and they don't use it or they're kind of mm -hmm. like eh, whatever and it's just this really tough thing but where you guys are kind of like organizing this thing to be like a well-oiled machine so that the front end actually goes to the back end and makes an impact and and you know you're kind of like sharing responsibility in some way um but through a product through a productized way and you went out so before we kind of start wrapping up give, give me a little insight so you guys went and found this company creating this really cool um bluetooth powered thing and then you guys kind of are like licensing that from them using that in as a part of your service now that's an extension of your services basically grabbing these things get delivering to them to them physically and then them having to go and then you kind of train them on how to use them in this whole thing is that am i understanding properly yeah that's exactly it do you want to tell the story of how we came across time law uh yeah so i i was reading one of nate and license blogs like mm. um probably like mid June, two years ago. Um, and he was like, oh, I've found this thing that lets me like track my time. And I was like, oh, that's a pretty graph. And then I read into it. And I was like, hang on, that's actually sick. Did a bunch of reading. Uh, and then me and Shenny set up the business like three months later. Uh, and for Christmas, they were doing an offer where you got um, two subscriptions and two trackers for the price of one. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy one for me because I think this is sick. And he's going to get a Christmas present because I'll get it for free. Hey, so uh, we bought one. <laughs> we bought one for Christmas and I gave it to him and we set it up. And we found really quickly that like we just didn't know what to do with it. Like you start and you're like, okay, but well, what activities do I track? Like what should I be looking at to track? Like how does this work? Right. And it took like six months of not using it at all. And then we started, we, we kind of went back to basics and we're like, okay how should we like plan our work and shenny can get into the weeds of like how the agency runs and whatever the long and short of it is we use sprints we use stand-ups um 
and we use like planned ver work versus unplanned work. Um, as a result, we took a lot of those learnings and we kind of planted them onto onto the system. And then now here we are, like it's part of our service. It's something that we offer to clients. Like it, we have one, two, three, four, five currently out in the world that like five organizations that are currently putting this practice. So yeah, it's cool. It, we use it religiously, internally. It's super helpful when we come to like actually understanding what we spend our time doing. It forms part of our planning, like, yeah. 100% would recommend. And if anyone else wants to to hear more about it than, than a, a very complex description on a podcast, just reach out and, and, and we can set that up. And Shenny, so, so Shenny, as far as like how you guys organize and categorize uh, your time and what you're spending time on, how, how does that mentality, like, you know, coming from, maybe coming close to first principles, sort of where does that, um, how do you how do you think of that and how do you look at that because obviously that is not david's department and that is not my department <laughs> um that's a good question so <laughs> when it comes to this is one thing that i noticed about myself i am um, the work the one thing that i hate the most in the world is when i'm doing work and i know i need to do work and there's something that's like in the way of it so if I have my phone out and I'm on and I'm scrolling through Instagram, just doing whatever, and I'm doing work at the same time, I, I kind of I get I was almost like I get lactic acid in my brain. I do not <laughs> like it at all. There's literally the best explanation for it. So I quickly realized that deep work was kind of like the way forward. Uh, deep work, 60 to 90 minute, essentially sprints, where it's just heavy on, heavy off, heavy on, heavy off throughout the day makes you do 10 times more than you would if you just done nine hours with your phone in your hand whilst you're doing your work. Yeah, That's kind of like essentially the first principle of time tracking in general. So we have uh, productive, we have planned work and we have unplanned work and we have productive and we have uh, unproductive work or non-productive work. Those are split essentially um, eight ways on the timeline in the way that we set it up. And the whole idea is to understand how, what's the best way to get in as much productive work as possible, both planned and unplanned? And what's the way to minimize all of the reasons why anything unplanned, that's uh, anything unproductive, non-productive would turn up. So a whole idea is about doubling down on what's working and figuring out solutions as to what's not working. And the best way to essentially, so that's kind of like the micro way of, of looking at it. And when we come and trying to that building that up and making that sort of like the macro version of it, uh, that's where sprints come in. So uh, we run seven day sprints at our at our agency, where essentially we have a fat to do list, and then we bucket them into you know is this urgent work? Is this not urgent work? Is this important or is this you know bullshit? Should we just throw it away? <laughs> and once we've bucketed it, we just pick the th four, five, six most important things on that on that list. And we stick them, we, we basically work on only those for the week. And as we work on those, we have a we have our, a very complex notion set up, which is very kind of automated, not really automated, but it's basically like I go in it like 25 minutes every week. I set it up and we have a direction for the whole week on exactly what needs to be done. And we know if it's to do, if it's doing, or if it's done or not. And everything is but everything is boxed up into each department of the business, wherever it be, you know, sales and closing, prospecting, fulfillment, um, content creation, and just all of those, you know, backend setup for any new clients that we may have, onboarding, all of that kind of stuff. It's all bucketed in departments. It's all arranged in, uh, I guess, importance, and, it's, and everybody's tagged in it. So everybody knows what needs to be done and what priority everything needs to be done in. And we just move things from left to right. And once it's right, it's done. And we can tick it off. And that's one thing done. And we can track as the weeks go by, what are we doing really well and what are we fucking up on? And understanding what we're doing poorly on is kind of the way that we understand, okay, if we're doing badly here, there's a reason why. So find out the reason and we can stop it from happening again. And that's one of the core tenets of our actual productivity accelerator because every business is going to have situations where... <clears throat> somebody's had to put out a fire because some nonsense has happened, which could have been prevented four weeks ago. 
And yeah. when you do your, you know, you build on, you know, like why, you ask why, kind of like the whole uh, Toyota production system idea of five whys. When you ask why enough, you get to the reason as to why things have happened. And once you get to that reason why, which was the four weeks ago thing, you know what not to do anymore. You know how to essentially stop that from being a factor again. And once you've done that, you put a plan into position and now you act on that and then the loops just go on and on and on and on. And that is essentially the most, that's the easiest way to continue high productivity for a long period of time, especially when you intertwine good rest with it. Amazing, man. Amazing. No, it's, Jesus, you run, you run a tight ship, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> you would not believe. You run a tight you would not ship, believe. my man. Good God. Um, no, it's really inspiring, honestly, man, because then I think anyone listening, I mean, listen to the way that, I mean, that's a very, you know, and, and we, we, we mentioned first principles, at the beginning of the question, and you really did take it back to that kind of, you know, the, the, the Toyota, you know, the Toyota manufacturing line, the five Y taking it into this kind of like, you know, tracking it all the way back, you know what I mean? To that root of like, Hey, we didn't ask that question on the onboarding form, for example. And now we're in a, bag of shit and it's like because we basically just didn't answer you know ask this question or qualify that client this way or we didn't um you know somebody didn't know what to do with that exact time or whatever it was right and you're you're tracking it back um the notion dashboard sounds really interesting uh also like notion is such an awesome tool and i think you know uh, most agencies i talk to are using it nowadays like in some fashion i think kind of like what you're saying and moving things left to right but that's uh really really insightful and i think anyone listening man like definitely um i think these these <laughs> these guys are good guys to reach out to man if you have uh you know any any uh qu questions or you feel like your time's going into outer space and you don't know where your time's going man because it's like uh, <laughs> and i assume you guys are like you know because uh david's twitter is very active um kind of explaining some of these concepts and talking about um, you know, kind of the neural marketing sides of things and a couple other uh, subjects that I've seen, but getting into the organization of how you guys are actually working, you know, your agency uh, is is really awesome because, you know, I there's a lot of fly by night people. I mean, be, just getting started is so hard, as you guys know, I think, you know, it's just like getting started is the hardest part. Um, and maybe we can kind of end a little bit with that here. I know I don't want to take too much of you guys time here. I think we've we've covered like an unbelievable breadth of subjects. And I think there's just enough value to definitely get somebody kind of going whoa i need to at least thinking like man i need to rethink you know what i'm what i'm doing in my day you know i mean i'm even thinking the same thing you know what i mean i'm like shit i gotta like uh these guys are kind of like <laughs> give, giving me some game here where i'm like shit i need to like what, what am i doing with my days man she's crazy <laughs> in a big city too you know i know you guys are in london you know and, and i'm here in mexico city it's like these are you know multiple multiple millions of people you know in these cities and um and the days go fast. I don't know if you guys feel that, but man, the days fly here, dude. I especially here, man. It's like you literally you go outside to eat, you come back, and like the fucking day is over. It's like what just happened to the time, you know? So being organized like that, especially in the city life thing, man, it's very, very, very important. Otherwise, like your time can just like fly into the air, and you just don't know what the hell's going on, right? With the with the chaos of it. Um, so yeah, this is all great stuff. I you know, I'm just kind of like overwhelmed with all the information you guys have given me. I'm kind of like uh, glitching out here. So I apologize. Yeah, we can start too to, much. Yeah, no, it was it was intense, man. I think, you know, this is a really I'll just wrap up by saying really interesting angle uh, on your agency, taking outbound and applying like neuro marketing and neuroscience to it and these mental models that you guys have like learned through your studies and also in the real world now much more so i think you know what i mean where you guys are actually applying the models and seeing the results actually come in which is in my opinion the best feeling ever you know what i mean when you actually like get in the depths of something really learn it you kind of you get it you kind of understand it and then you actually fucking apply it and it's like whoa okay this doesn't work at all or this is working and i need to <laughs> double down on something or you know it's really an exciting process so you guys obviously are like in that process right now and it's um kind of intoxicating uh to talk to you guys about it um you've got the productivity is the natural extension to the sales teams that you're providing leads to i think that also is like epic um i think that that's not that's a very non-linear kind of thought process like obviously like Kenny had originally said fulfillment would be that next thing but you know and, or I've, I've heard a lot like i know when we were doing this it was like oh we we need to like build sales teams for these guys and it's like 
it's too much work. It's insane. You know what I mean? To go do that is just not, you're like basically opening up Pandora's box into another whole other angle. How are you going to focus on that initial thing that you're doing, which is providing leads, which is really like the bread and butter of the thing. So you guys found a way to kind of funnel that, find partnerships, increase productivity, use things internally that then you're able to bring externally to your clients. This is just like, all of this is just epic in my opinion. Like it's really inventive, really cool thinking in a field and in a you know the agency world and all this stuff that's pretty pretty stale and you have people kind of just telling you like this is how to build an agency and it's like it couldn't be further from the truth especially when like people come from such different backgrounds and all this stuff so i think that's like um one thing i'm really interested with um and then breaking down your guys's organizational systems and how you're constantly improving productivity and trying to maximize you know like the effectiveness of the work you're putting in the deep work that shenny had mentioned all this stuff is just epic so sorry about the monologue there but like just processing it is like <laughs> pretty pretty heavy to take in so I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and like start wrapping this up we got to do this again um i think down the line a little bit i would love to see where you guys end up because i think you know this uh yeah you're not thinking like uh like you said with the neural marketing tradition you're not you're not thinking like other people are thinking you guys are doing something um very different and i and i really appreciate that um so you guys are launching a podcast let's let's dive into that for one second uh get out of the neuroscience uh <laughs> You know, fuck. I feel like I'm. You know, I need to. I need to go take a walk after this. Um, what? Uh, what's the podcast? You know, you guys have kind of hinted at not making it a full psychology podcast. You want to put in some kind of different, diverse stuff in there. What can people expect from the podcast? And um, and uh, yeah, I, I'll definitely be plugging it here in the text. You know, below the podcast here, but uh, this this podcast. But um, yeah, what's 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 the deal with the podcast, man? What are you guys doing there? Shenny, you want to you, you want to open up on this, and then I'll yeah. finish up. Yeah, great, great interviews, great banter, and a lot of <laughs> a lot Big of banter, dude. Yeah, <laughs> so I mean, this is a lot of a lot of what we wanted to see because we're both quite we're both quite um we do listen to podcasts from time to time, just like our own a lot, a lot of our favorite podcasts, and we kind of take bits from here. We take we want to take lots of bits from different 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 podcasts, especially like layout and the type of interview styles that we see we just wanted to basically have a crack at it and we i know that when you do podcasting you get to meet some amazing people you get to have some amazing conversations so it's the best way to engineer it and who who's everybody does banter so we're all <laughs> good with that as well so true no so true it's so it's so insanely helpful and i think anyone listening to man this is like I have a buddy, and I said this, I think, in another episode, but I have a buddy uh, who's like a music guy who I who I, I used to tour with and stuff. He's a good dude. Um, but he recently told me something like a quote because he's running a podcast, but it's more about like kind of like spiritual, weird uh, kind of like conspiracy theory kind of. He's the he's a real <laughs> out there kind of guy. And he's doing this That's amazing podcast. Well, and it's getting a huge following. It's like he's he's like a kind of a micro celebrity or something all of a sudden with this podcast uh, when he was just kind of like a rocker guy before he's playing bands all the time. But he told me recently, he was like, you know, man, I really feel like deeply that podcasting is like the new heavy metal. It's like the new punk, you know, <laughs> like, like, like kind of, uh, you know, transition in society, like podcasts, like punk is over and you know, all that stuff is over, you know what I mean? Music is like pretty much over as far as like being like a statement of like, you know, against society. Podcasting is the new that. And I was like, <laughs> whoa, dude, it's it's true though, you know? It's like people really like interviewing people and exchanging ideas. And so anyway, yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you 100% on that. I think you guys, meeting people, you meet the most amazing people and um, you find connections where you just maybe wouldn't have found them before. So it's really cool. Yeah, so our, our whole kind of like goal of this podcast is to, we wanted to speak to people who are doing really cool things, right? So people like yourself who have, you know, you've done agency work, you've done all kinds of stuff, and you've got multiple SaaSes, you're running successful businesses, you're building communities. Yes, all of those things are great, but I kind of don't care about any of that. What I actually want to find out about is you as a person. I want to hear yeah. about the fact that you've toured in multiple countries doing all this crazy stuff. I want to know why you live in Mexico City and have done for the last five years. Like that is, it's the human behind the achievements and the successes that I'm really interested in. And we thought about doing a podcast that really focuses on that and finding out kind of like who is the person behind 
the kind of the gold plated achievements because i think that's what people get caught up in especially now with like instagram culture being what it is everyone is focused on who is the idealized version of whatever 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 right yeah. and because and shenny's referenced it a couple of times within within this episode like because we're so candid with each other like i know very much like who shenny is as a person he knows exactly who i am as a person and neither of us do a very good job of like showing the rest of the world obviously for you know for, for obvious reasons why we why we aren't as open with the rest of the world but yeah. i think our goal when we started this was to find people who are doing really interesting things on the face of it and then dig in to like who they are as people what else have they done so you know whether it's they've they are running club nights in in ibiza or whatever before they ended up starting a multi-million pound agency or whether they were like a, a football freestyle or whatever right like right. i want to find out about the person behind it and that's what really interests me yeah that's that's a great that's a great uh it's a great goal i think you know I, i've I definitely am like in the same spirit as you guys with that. I think, you know, like figuring out, I like to hear about people's past, you know, cause it's kind of funny. Like, I feel like you can pick up so many little things, you know, from, from people's past mm -hmm. that are sort of like idiosynchronous. Now you're like, what, like, what, why, what, huh? You know, like, <laughs> what the hell, you know? And it's, um, you know, and I, and I know that in my own life too, you know, it's like uh, everybody I'm surrounded with, like went to college, did all these things. And I like did none of it at all. I just like opted out completely. And it's really, uh, it's interesting to meet people that are just from diverse backgrounds, but we all kind of you know intersect and everything like that. And um, yeah, no, I'm excited about your guys' podcast. So that podcast is gonna be called Base Camp, correct? Absolutely, it is. Yeah. And Base we are gonna have you on. We're gonna have you on very soon. I would love to. I would love to. You just let me know when. And uh, and Base Camp is, is is gonna be awesome. You guys got definitely got to check that out. And um, yeah, I'll I'll definitely support you guys in any way I can. I love podcasts, and uh, like I said, they're the they're the punk rock of our era, apparently of this era. So I, you know, you got to kind of get into that, man, get into the spirit. Um, I'll definitely send you my buddy's podcast. So you guys will fucking, you guys will love it. It's called contain. And, um, okay. you know, he's, he's really interesting. I, I, he has a couple of very strange episodes that, uh, recently I really like, and he always has musical interludes in the middle of the podcast. So like people are talking and then like a point kind of concretizes and then it like goes into like a musical, sort of uh like um interlude back into the conversation again you know things like this so yeah it's really yeah like you know there's a lot of diverse stuff you can do there i i'm, I'm keeping it to the bare bones at the moment but man i'm always thinking about man you know, yeah, this could actually kind of like you can get kind of weird with this stuff and like really play <laughs> with people's minds while they're listening and they're kind of like whoa what the, you know if, if you lose them for a second i think he does it because like people lose they're listening and then they get numb to it, right? And then he kind of hits it with a minute, and then you get back into it again. Um, so maybe some neuro, some neuroscience to that. I'm not sure, but uh, but yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, fascinating. Looking forward to the to the podcast and uh, everybody keep an eye out for that. Lead Hawks um, is David and Shenny's uh, agency that we've spoken about a ton. Uh, Lead Hawks, like a hawk, like a bird. Uh, dot mm -hmm. o dot uk um go check these guys out uh this is you know and if you're a b2b startup and you need some help uh i i would recommend these dudes hugely i think that these are the guys you need to go to and if you're not convinced of that by now i'd be i'd be pretty confused <laughs> um so i want to thank you guys so much man for being here and uh any any closing thought oh also real quick also go follow on twitter uh go follow david at at david jacob underscore one david jacob underscore one Go follow him on Twitter, see his pink background insanity and um, <laughs> read the insights, embody the insights, get get into this stuff. Because I think um, these guys are definitely on on the precipice of something that's really rare to see and rare to find and interesting. And um, God, you guys are like getting great results by using proven mental models. Like what's cooler than that? And I know I used to watch Sam Ovens videos, man, like a couple of years ago, Sam Ovens used to do these, these videos like every day or every week, or he was doing them insane. Mm -hmm. It was like a, I don't know what he was. He just put the cell phone up and he would just do these videos. He was doing them all the time. And I used to trip on his mental models stuff where he would lay out these mental models. And, um, you know, it's just really interesting kind of like dive into what you guys are doing and kind of applying that to an industry that is growing. There's new startups every single day. Um, boy, you guys, you know, yeah, I, I love what you guys are doing, man. I'm really excited about this. So really glad to have you guys on any closing thoughts, man, drop it on the people. Cause they, they need to learn. They need to, they need to get out of their parents' basement and shit, man. Like what's, what's next? <laughs> what can they do? <laughs> uh 
take take Shenny's approach, don't take mine. Is is the honest the honest advice I would give to anyone is pick one thing and then do it every single day for you know even if it's an hour a day just do it every single day for the next six months and it is almost impossible to fuck it up if you do it that way if you do what i do and you ping from something that's interesting to something else that's interesting something else that's interesting you'll just end you you end up really broad but really narrow uh, sorry really broad but really shallow and that's not useful to man or beast um i am a self-described generalist um which i think has its benefits but I think if you asked me and Shenny, we'd rather be the other person. So he's a he's a very specialized specialist. He's amazing at five things, whereas I'm mediocre to passable at 150 things. I would much rather be a specialist, and I think he would rather be a generalist. The world is is now very slowly moving towards generalism, which is great for me. It's but terrible for me, if I, but yeah. <laughs> you better <laughs> hope that one of those five things is useful. Um, but no, like... If, if, if I could give any advice, it's do the same thing over and over again for six months. And there will be outsized returns waiting for you on day, you know, 180 or whatever it ends up being, depending on the calendar year. Yeah, good good insights there. Shani, what about you, dude? Um, closing thoughts here. Closing thoughts. I would say uh, pick up Deep Work by Cal Newport. There's awesome. a lot of amazing... Uh, I guess, tidbits of information there, which will basically serve as the foundation for any good kind of, for any kind of like good work you want to do in general. You pick up that book and you'll have a system with which to do what David's advice is. Yeah. And from then, you know, the world's your oyster. There you go. Deep work. Well, right right from the man's, from uh, Shenny's mouth there to, uh, to your ear, man. Pick up deep work. Um, yeah, I mean, I know what you mean, David. I, I, I'm, I'm also a generalist. I'm also like, I'm probably the worst. You know, I mean, deep work is like an, an understatement. You know, I just get like obsessive into whatever I'm doing, and I'm yeah. just like, bah! I just go crazy. You know, for like way too long, and I'm just like, you know, I piss everybody off around me. Like, I'm too, too nerdy. You know, for this world or whatever. But um, <laughs> definitely, the world of the generalist is definitely like opening up in a strange sense. Like, I think, but. Um, you know, Shani, I wouldn't worry, man. There's always that. You, you will always outperform, you know, the, the generalist when it comes. And you guys are partnered up. Again, I go back to partnerships. That is something that I talk about a lot. That's just so important, man. Like going it alone is, you know, me, me, me or, or David all alone. It's 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 a rough road. You know what I mean? Like, and I, I know it firsthand. You know what I mean? And Shani all alone is also a rough, rough road. You know what I mean? Where it's like, it's it's too compartmentalized and, and two things aren't you know popping out of left field and being able to be then assimilated into a system so that you know find part pick your partners properly um you know have some agreement with your partners make sure that you guys have like see eye to eye on things and um that you're not just diving into something you don't know you know what what the future looks like about it and um pick up you know i you guys have any psychology book you know recommendations like stuff to kind of get into understanding sort of the human psyche and and picking your partners well and kind of understanding these these patterns. I'm curious if you guys have like direct recs on that. Picking your partners well is super tough. And I don't think there's enough uh, written about it, but we, it's a shameless plug for our own Twitter. Um, we, we, wrote a, uh, we wrote a really interesting thread that's all about this idea of like either being a, um, someone with a lot of diligence, so Shenny, or someone with a lot of charisma, which is more me. Um, when it comes to picking partners, I think there needs to be a balance, ultimately. Um, I think there probably will be books on the psychology of like, you know, team formation and stuff. Will they be particularly accessible? Will they be interesting to read? Probably not. Um, if, if you want to talk about partnerships, I think a really great one is um, The Hard Thing About Hard Things which is Anderson and um, Ben, what's his name? Ben Horowitz. Hor yeah, Ben Horowitz. Yeah, ben Horowitz yeah. um, fascinating book. I think that's awesome. Uh, I think um, Shoe Dog is also really interesting. It talks about Phil Knight and all of the different kind of like people that he had to go through to get to, um, to get Nike off the ground. But in terms of like traditional psych, the best book, and I recommend this to basically everyone, is not influenced by Cialdini because that is over over recommended and underutilized by everyone who reads it. Um, it's actually the Art of Thinking Clearly by Rolf Debelli. 
So my one has a white cover with a gold circle on it, which says the art of thinking clearly. Um, this has, I think it is, hang on, I'll tell you how many it's got in it. A um, hundred different cognitive biases in it, all with and a little story that helps you remember it. Um, and I think that for most people, understanding cognitive biases is the best way of getting into psychology. Because otherwise you're just going to get an author's version of like one of the most important ones. And ultimately, most people aren't in like interesting or intelligent enough to go away from the classic like five or six that everyone references. Yeah. yeah. So you'll yeah. always get reciprocity. You will always get commis- commit- commit- commitment, consistency. <laughs> liking bias. You know, yeah, you're always going to get liking bias. Like stuff like that. It makes more sense just to have, and this is where me being a generalist comes in, like go and get a really broad understanding of like 50 to 100 different ones. And then of that, intuitively, you'll be able to figure out which ones you like the most or are the most relevant to your life or whatever. whatever. Awesome, man. Awesome. Glad we ended with that. Great, great insights. Great recommendations. Thank you guys so much for being on again. And uh, hopefully we do this soon. I'll be jumping on your soon too. So you just let me know, man. I'm excited. Uh, Basecamp. <laughs> Look out for Basecamp podcast. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All right. I really hope you enjoyed that. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Always Building. Uh, If you want to learn more about Always Building, our community, our membership group, uh, and uh, exclusive webinars and trainings and discounts on software and all kinds of fun stuff, you know, get help along the journey so you're not all alone uh, in this whole thing. Um, Go ahead and check out alwaysbuilding.io. That's alwaysbuilding.io. And again, thank you so much. Best of luck on your journey. And you just let me know. You can reach out to me uh, on Twitter or via email, alex at alwaysbuilding.io uh, or at always underscore building uh, on Twitter. Okay, thanks again. Have a great one.